God speak to you all. Let's go ahead and um, open with prayer. And let's begin identifying the fact that we are the baptized, right? And that we are set apart in relationship with God. One of the, one of the things that I think we always have to come back to, particularly when everything's not going our way, is um, to remember that the thing that we always celebrate is that God has locked himself into us in relationship. And that, um, you know, I think about Gail, uh, I, I love that we're married, right? And so even though there's things that she does that I really like, uh, there's things that she does sometimes that I don't really like. And, um, you know, there's things I do for her, things she does. And it, even though we're thankful for those things, uh, the thing that really is wonderful is that we know we're in this connection. And that's the same with friendships. It's the same with family. It's uh, what you're thankful for really isn't what they do. <laughs> what you're thankful for is who they are and how they're connected to you and how they're committed to you. And I think that when we come back around to our faith, that's really what we always have to come back to is the fact that we're being thankful, that, or when we even do Eucharist, Eucharist means Thanksgiving. This, the, in that Thanksgiving prayer that we pray, when we take the bread and the wine, it always comes back to God, you have sent Jesus so that you would be our Father and that the Spirit would come amongst us. It's always talking about the framing out of this thing we've got. <laughs> the fact that Almighty God is sort of locked into us and sort of thrown away the key and He's in with us. God is in with us. And so we celebrate the fact that, that we belong to God and that we are in relationship with God. And whatever happens, we know that if it doesn't look good, he's always working to bring good. And if it's good, it's good, right? But it, either way, we just begin to enjoy the fact that he's in it with us. God is in this with us. So let's go ahead and open our hearts. And we start in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And precious Spirit of God, we... We welcome you into this space. We're thankful for this day. We're thankful that you have leaned into us, that you have been with us. And we pray that um, as we come to the close of the day and the bookend of this eights on the day, that um, you would sort of help us to be drawn in once again and affirmed and confirmed in the fact that we belong to you and that you are our God and the grace and the um, strength that emerge from that. We give you thanks. Amen. Blay Bartell, I love you, man. Good to see you. You're sharing tomorrow night, aren't you? Right, good, good, good. We're hoping you'll get it right. And then Father Paul will straighten everybody out after, if you don't get it exactly like, you know how we are we're exact on everything. <laughs> okay, um, we're not gonna take a lot of time tonight, I hope. Uh, I was, I was, I was thinking about just as we're processing, at least as I'm processing my life, and thinking about, you know, now how many weeks has it been, guys? How many? How long have we? We haven't been meeting for how many weeks? Four weeks? No. About thirty-six. About thirty-six days. Thirty-six weeks, I think. Was... Oh, thirty. We haven't been meeting for thirty-six. <laughs> In gone to lion. Uh, it, it's been how many days? I mean, it's been a while. It's been over a month, right? Yeah. It's a long time. And uh, one of the things that, um, that happened inside me, I don't know about you guys, but one of the things that happened inside me is when things stay at a certain place where they're not exactly what I had hoped that they would be at, I tend to start drying out a little bit. I find myself almost like uh, a description of a drought. Um, my expectations are not met or... Um, I have some unexpected things that I wasn't quite calibrating toward. And I find that I have this thirst that intensifies in me. And uh, I think that we can really quickly get, the scriptures calls it dry and weary. <laughs> and uh, uh, there's a text that I thought about this morning or yesterday, whatever it was, uh, I wanted to share out of Jeremiah 3, where God is speaking to Israel and they were not in the best place. They were kind of in a tough spot. And uh, Jeremiah, speaking for God as a prophet, says to them, and this is God speaking to them, it says, my people have committed two sins. And then he articulates them. One, my people have forsaken me, 
not recognizing that I am the spring of living water. You remember Jesus, when he talked to that lady at the well, he said, if you knew who I was, you'd ask me for this water, right? This living water that you drink from. And he said, my people have forsaken me as the spring of living water. And then the second sin is that they've dug their own wells looking for water. They dug, they've dug their own cisterns, which were like um, made out of clay that would collect water as water would come. And he says, they've dug their own wells, which are broken wells, broken cisterns that really cannot hold water. And so the first sin um, that he articulates in this space that's dry and deserty and things are not quite what they need to be, the first way that they miss God's heart is that they forget that there's nothing on the earth besides God who can really be living water for us that um, there's no way there are things present around us that can scratch all the ways that we itch. <laughs> uh, there's something in us that longs for more than what's here. Um, there's something in us that's reaching out to secure something. And, and the danger is we'll forget that that really is God calling us. And so we forget that he's the one or God is the one that is the spring of living water we have and that, that nothing here can really address the needs that we carry uh, in the human experience. Uh, the psalmist said in Psalm 63, we live in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Think about that. I mean, the claim is nothing here will really fix things in us, that, that if everything was going horrible or everything was going good and perfect, we're still in the midst of whatever happens. We have this kind of ache in us. We have this kind of thing in us that we have to, I think, I'd recognize this, that there's no way anything in the world, circumstance change would ever make all things well for us. Um, there's a text in Ecclesiastes that really articulates this well. It's such a depressing text, but I'll share it with you. And um, I think sometimes our hope has to start in the fact that there's loss around us. But look at this. Um, he said, this is the Ecclesiastes start. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. <laughs> Not very helpful. But then he goes on later in the text. He says, the, I, the preacher, I'm the one that's talking, he says, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem. This is Solomon writing. And I set my mind to seek and explore by wisdom concerning all that has been done under heaven. It is a grievous task which God has given to the sons of men to be afflicted with. I have seen all the works which have been done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity, emptiness, right? Striving after the wind. In other words, what you think is there really isn't there. What is crooked cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. I said to myself, behold, I have magnified and increased wisdom more than all who were over Jerusalem before me, and my mind has observed a wealth of wisdom and knowledge. And as I set my mind to know wisdom and to know madness, and folly, I realize that this also is striving after the wind. Again, he's just simply saying, nothing here seems to fix what's going on in me. Because in much wisdom, there's much grief and increasing knowledge results in increasing pain. And then he goes on, I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure. So I enjoyed, so enjoy yourself. And behold, it was too, it too was futility. I said of laughter, it's madness and a pleasure. What does it accomplish? I explored with my mind how to stimulate my body with wine. And while my mind was guiding me wisely and how to take hold of folly until I could see what good there is for the sons of men to do under the heavens, uh, the few years of our lives, I enlarged my works. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself. I planted them with all kinds of fruit trees. Others, he was successful. I made ponds for water for myself from which I could irrigate the forest and growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and I had homeborn slaves. I also possessed flocks and herds larger than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. Also, I collected for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I provided for myself male and female singers and the pleasures of men, many concubines. Then I became great and increased more than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. My wisdom also stood for, by me and all that my eyes desired, I did not refuse them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure for my heart was pleased because of all the labor that was, it, that, and this was the, my reward for all my labor. Thus I considered all my activities which my hands had done 
and the labor which I had exerted, and behold, it was all vanity, striving after the wind, and there was no profit under the sun. <laughs> What's he saying? He's saying, no matter what you do, you're always kind of in the land of the suck. No matter what you think you end up with, there's nothing there that really can fulfill what's in you. So, so I think that when you're, one of the things I try to remember whenever I get in spaces where it seems like I'm getting less than I want, I, I try to remember that in the worst times of my life, it, it's, it's, I, it's so easy to think, if only this changed, and I try to attach myself to it, if I could only get this to change. But the reality is, is that no matter what change, because I look at the best times in my life, uh, I found that, that what was happening was never enough. When I was in, in the 80s, when I started pastoring, you know, anybody who pastors, or most of us who pastor, you know, you think, I would love to pastor a large church. I'd love to pastor something significant. And so I would kind of be tormented by that a little bit. And when we ended up moving and coming to Tulsa and ended up with a church that exploded into this, this thing that was bigger than I ever thought, you know, I could do. And as I'm sitting there looking at it, I thought to myself, why don't I like this? Or I think about the times where, whether it was, I remember the day they told me, I mean, as an author, you think, man, if I could only sell some books, right? I mean, th wouldn't that be nice to sell some books if you write? And the day they called me and said, hey, you, your, your uh, book has hit the New York Times bestselling list. And I go, really? And it stayed on there for a number of weeks. And I remember the thing that surprised me so much about it is that it didn't touch me. It was like I was going, okay. It, it didn't change anything in me. I mean, I was thankful, grateful, I guess, more than anything. Just, oh, that's nice. But it wasn't like it made me feel any better about me. It wasn't like it brought any more joy to me. Uh, there's just um, getting my degrees. I thought, you know, I get my bachelor's, I get my master's, and I kept thinking, oh, this will be something. And every time I got a degree, I really, you know, it hangs on my wall. <laughs> and but now I'm finishing my PhD and I'm thinking to myself, I'm not really caring. So I don't know if I have to fight that hard to get it. I'm just going to work on it and do it. My point is, is that at the end of the day, we live in a dry and weary land where there is no water. There's nothing here that will ever quench what's going on inside you. And when you're in places of where things are kind of withheld from us, like I think is happening a little bit here, I always try to remember that. And that's why the psalmist said, when he said, we live in a dry and weary land where there is no water, the psalmist said right before he said that was, oh God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So there's this kind of sense that he was saying, Really, the only solution to what's going on is you, God. And that touches that Israel's first sin. Remember, that first sin he articulated was, my people have committed two sins. One, they've forsaken me. They've forgotten that I am the spring of living water. And I think that's where we always have to start. And I know that it's hard to do because it sounds a little woo-woo. <laughs> it sounds a little spiritual. It sounds a little ethereal. What do you mean God is my water? And I don't know how that looks for you, but you're going to have to figure out how to open up your life to God, what that constitutes for you. Look in your history. But remember that really your connection with God is really what you're after. It's not something that can happen in your life. It's someone who can happen in your life. And then the second thing that he says, the second sin is, they forsaken me the spring of living water. And the second sin is since they've forsaken me in the spring of living water, they've dug their own wells. They've tried to dig their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. In other words, we start trying to figure out how to get water somewhere. And generally speaking, it's not pretty. Generally speaking, it's not smart. Generally speaking, it's sort of sinful, right? I don't know what you do to escape in when you're tired or you're hungry or you're threatened or you're angry or you somehow you, you're disappointed, where do you go? You know, where do you start scratching to see if you can get yourself a little water, right? To try to figure out how to, is it shopping? Is it shoplifting? <laughs> I mean, what, what do you do with your life? Is it, is it in jumping into too much food or too much, entertainment or too much sensuality or too much busyness? What, what do you and I do? 
And where do we hide? And because hiding is really evidence of us trying to create a cistern. But the problem is, it's not that, it's not that even if it's sinful, it's not that the problem with sin doesn't mean you're evil. That's really not it. God doesn't see us as evil. Sin is Jesus bore our sin. The problem with sin is that it points to our brokenness. Sin is just us trying to carry water that only God can give us. Sin is trying to come up with our own solutions of drinking source where there is no source but in God and we try to make something up. And, and the problem with sin is just the brokenness that we experience. And when you're broken, you lose the capacity of your life to love and you start to withdraw. And so the reason we come to confess our sins, the reason we come to, because, to open ourselves up in times of prayer and that sort of thing is because we're trying to make sure that on some level, um, unconfessed sin means unforgiveness. And when we're in unforgiveness, we can't give. We're in ungiving. There's just no way that we can be loving. And so the real challenge for us in seasons of desert, in seasons of disappointment, in seasons of changed expectations, is that we have to remember who we are and remember that the only source of water in the midst of this is God and however that, whatever that looks like for you. Somebody saying something to him from Jim, quoting C.S. Lewis, there is one prayer that God never answers, encore, encore. <laughs> Good. Yeah, more, 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 more. So anyway, any thoughts or comments or do you want to confess your sin? Because I'm here to listen. While you were talking about pursuing God and not digging our own wells, um, I was thinking about our generosity liturgy mm. that we pray every week at Sanctuary and how godliness with contentment uh. is a great game. That pursuing God and having this well of gratefulness and thanksgiving in us um it's hard 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 to do there's a kind of cliche thing i've seen being passed around that just says um remember when you wanted everything that you have and it just speaks to this idea that we are always longing for more and something different and kind of always chasing after something um and i was thinking you know it's so easy for us to get caught up and identify uh, find our identity in so much of our busyness and our work and our schedules and how on some level um, this whole like screeching halt that has come to our lives um, on some level it's what a lot of us have wanted for a long time <laughs> yes and yes. how it's also exposing something in us that maybe what we really wanted wasn't what we wanted after all yes but the ladder that we're climbing up is leaning against something wrong <laughs> Yeah. It's not, we're climbing it, but it doesn't really lead to what we think it's going to lead to. Oh my gosh. Yeah. How, how many of you, or how does it hit you, the idea that there's nothing that changes or could change for you that would solve or cross every T or dot every I in your soul? What if we're in a land, in a place where what we're looking for isn't even here? it might change our motivation for why we do what we do, which for the believer is to glorify God, not to get something. Hey, One of the big marks for me was um, when I turned 59 because of the things that I'd run into, the opportunities that I had, I got to a place where I could think about retiring and um, which was huge. I mean, it's such a huge moment. And when I got there, I thought to myself, I don't like this at all. <laughs> I just, there's just nothing you're going to do that's going to make you happy. It's really our only happiness is in God. How does that inform us in a season like this? I do I see Bella saying something? 
that she needs to share with everyone? No. <laughs> I want to hear what you're going to say, Bella. I wasn't going to say anything. I wasn't going to say anything. You can no, just. I, I, we were, I just got here. <laughs> I don't even know what's going on. <laughs> we're just talking about the Lord, Bella. I figured, I figured that's why I popped in. <laughs> I think there's a little bit of a, I don't know, a little bit of a discouragement to it. Yes. Yes. Say again. I think there's a little bit of a discouragement. Yes. To that, that, yeah. I mean, you just can't, it's not a feel good message. No, no, I don't want to, you know. Yes. Yeah. And this isn't a really a feel good time. No. no. <laughs> My know. wife hates it when I talk like this. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, and not just right now, but what, I mean, this few months here, it's not just a real feel good time in our, yeah, in our history. Yeah. So. You got to turn in your Pentecostal card, Pastor Ed, with talk uh, like you mean have a little more victory going on here? Yeah, we need some more victory. <laughs> See, I, I actually think the victory is in this idea that there's nothing here that can help us. And so we really do say, I'm not going to try to make it work. I'm going to open myself and figure out what in the world that looks like to tap into the God who is living water. And, and you know how that text goes in Psalm 73, whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. My portion means what I'm after. And so when we do that, then if I don't want a happy marriage to fulfill me or a great career to fulfill me or a new boat to fulfill me or a better something to fulfill me or more friends to fulfill me, or more money to fulfill me, all of a sudden I can enter into life fulfilled and living out with God to do all those things. And whether I have great success or whether I have not so much great success, you stay steady because God is the strength of my life. And whom do I desire on earth beside you? I don't. You're the only one there. Everything else is not critical doesn't mean you can't enjoy it and be happy and love good friendships and good relations. Those are all just great graces. But you also have the strength to bear bad friendships and bad situations and heartache because God is the strength of our life. Bishop Ed, mm. I think that, I mean, God seems like there's something in us that always is looking for the best. Like, um, always hoping for the best, wanting the best. There's a difference between hoping, you know, it's just realizing the difference, hoping for the best, doing the best, being the best, doesn't mean that what we perceive is the best is really the best, yes. right? Sometimes we try to manipulate that, yeah. to get what we want, but when, like, this has brought us to a screeching halt, which is, Great. It's just that we don't have a choice. When we have a choice to stop, that's one thing. When we don't have a choice and we have to, you know, that a little bit different. Yes. But, yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, that's, you guys get it. You know, we, we, um, we're believers. We're in and we're in for whatever happens. And our hope is in God. And uh, things keep steady because of that. And we pull our emotions up. We set our emotions on things above, not on things of the earth, where Christ is and our life is hidden with Christ. I got all these kinds of ideas. The question is how that works out in your life. You got to figure that out. I mean, hopefully with things like prayer and scripture and each other, we help each other to help figure that out. But it's not easy. And, and the good news, if you can't figure it out and you're just dragging along, bumming out every other day, God still loves you. And you're still in and we will still love you. And it's not like it's the end of the world. I just think 
I, I just think that real happiness is not found in what haps <laughs> circumstances. True happiness is found in the person of God and in the fact that we're connected with him and that we can do all things through Christ. So interesting, Paul saying that I can do all things through Christ is not in the context of winning. It's in the context where things weren't working out for him. And he wasn't, didn't have enough food and didn't have enough this and the other. He said, that's okay, because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Okay, let's do this. Um, uh, let me pull up this um, confession, because I thought, you know, if we talk about sin a little bit, that we should end with a confession. And so let me do it. Let me pull it up and we'll do this as we close. I'm going to ask... Let's see if I can find it. Here we go. All right. Um, why don't you say this with me? Let's first of all call just to mind the ways that we haven't been loving and maybe some of the ways that we've been hiding, realizing God doesn't reject us and we don't have to be ashamed. We're not evil. Sin just means we're broken. So we just are owning our brokenness and we're wanting to say, God, help us not build our own wells or our own cisterns and try to get our own water, that our water is you. Jesus is the living water. And so let's say this together. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own heart. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And if we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And apart from your grace, there is no health in us. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare all those who confess their faults. Restore all those who are penitent according to your promises. Declared to all people in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O oh most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. And then receive this absolution. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and the consolation of his Holy Spirit. Thank you. Amen. Yeah. All right, guys, there you have it. Now you can go out and be real full of joy. <laughs> All right, Godspeed. Hope we can catch you in the morning for prayer. And then tomorrow night with Blaine. Bless you, brother. Godspeed, everybody. Do you want to say anything? What are you going to talk to us about? Jesus or something? Uh, actually, first of all, what you shared tonight was amazing. Um, I was just taking notes that it was really, really hopeful and helpful, believe it or not. Uh, I've learned to love Ecclesiastes uh, in the last five years. <laughs> I've had my ecclesiastical moments. So I'm actually, I was going to talk about some of the things you're sharing tonight. Um, just take it a, a little bit of a different direction. So I'm really looking forward to it. Wonderful. We're looking forward to being with you, my friend. All right, everybody have a good night's sleep. Godspeed to you.